What's up everyone? I'm Matt Martin, The Grass Factor, and today we are going to be unpacking the world of phosphites. Are they fertilizers? Are they fungicides? Do different formulations have different levels of efficacy? Are they biostimulants? Are they SAR elicitors? What exactly are phosphites? Today we're going to look at published data and empirical data to make the determination what exactly they are and should we include them in our turf management programs. Stick around, we've got a lot to unpack. Phosphites, also sometimes called phosphonates, are products and fungicide products really derived from phosphorus acid. Uh, phosphorus acid has been super popular in the agricultural industry over the years for being able to control certain diseases in avocados, macadamias, potatoes, onions, celery, and even cypress trees. However, phosphorus acid would not make a good fungicide in turf grass. Our vegetation in turf grass is simply too sensitive to handle it. Once you dilute phosphorus acid in water, it becomes phosphonic acid. And this is just simply too powerful for turf. So what manufacturers do will neutralize the phosphonic acid with an alkali salt. Commonly used is potassium hydroxide, a very basic material. This is an acid-base reaction that occurs that forms potassium phosphite. Sometimes you'll see sodium hydroxide use. This isn't common in the marketplace because sodium can be phytotoxic to plants. However, if you use sodium hydroxide, that would be an acid-base reaction that form sodium phosphite. There's even some formulations, for instance, like Aliet, acetyl aluminum, which is a reaction of phosphorus acid and ethanol to form an ethyl phosphonate that is then injected with aluminum ions to form the phosphatidyl aluminum. And each of these formulations have slight variations in terms of longevity and overall performance from the product. As we get into the technical details of these products, I think it's important that we go ahead and establish an understanding of the difference between phosphoric acid and phosphorus acid. Phosphoric acid, H3PO4, is primarily used to formulate fertilizers. It is a highly reactive, weak acid that is oftentimes reacted with an alkali salt to produce a phosphate fertilizer. So for instance, if you reacted phosphoric acid with ammonium, you would get ammonium phosphate. If you reacted phosphoric acid with potassium hydroxide, you get potassium phosphate. These are fully oxidized materials that have now become relatively stable because they're no longer in that highly reactive acid state. When we're talking about phosphoric acid, we're talking about purely fertilizers. However, in today's video, when we're talking about phosphorus acid, we're going to be talking about the derivatives of it that function like a fungicide. And, and oftentimes we see it in many different aspects of our life. For instance, glyphosate is a phosphonate. It is a reacted version of a phosphorus acid. We also see it in the medical industry as part of biphosphonates used in the treatment of osteoporosis. So these are very common products in our lives. And just like we see it in the medical industry or in the herbicide industry, we also see it in the fungicide industry. So again, for the context of this video, when we're talking about phosphorus acid, we are not talking about fertilizer because phosphorus acid does not function as fertilizer in the plant. And we'll get into more specifics of that as we go along. Now that we have that established and a little bit of some definitions to reference back to, let's answer the question, is phosphite a fungicide or a fertilizer? Well, it's not actually that easy to answer. And we'll kind of take this point by point. Number one, with the premise of phosphite acting as a fertilizer, first and foremost, the phosphite ion is taken into the plant as a phosphite ion. It does not dissociate. And I'll give you an example. For instance, when we make an aqueous solution of ammonium sulfate, where we dissolve ammonium sulfate in water, 
we get the separation of ammonium ions as NH3, and then we have our other section of ammonium sulfate, which would be our sulfate ions, SO4. They separate and they both can enter the plant independently of one another. However, when we're talking about a potassium phosphite, this molecule, a K3O3P, is taken into the plant as a K3O3P. It does not separate into a divided ionic form before it makes its way into the plant. And what's important about that is that because it does not dissociate into separate forms, existing only as the phosphite ion, it's only going to function one way, and it's as a phosphite ion, not as a potassium ion, not as a phosphorus ion, but as a phosphite ion. Now, point number two, when determining if phosphites act like fertilizers, let's look what happens once it's actually taken into the plant. Unfortunately, the plant does not know the difference whether it's a phosphite ion or a phosphate ion. So the plant takes it up as if it were a phosphate ion. And phosphites are much more soluble in water than phosphates. So it's easier for the plant to take up too much at one time. And this often leads phosphites at greater susceptibility to cause phytotoxic symptoms. Phytotoxic symptoms of phosphites within the plant often show up as either something that resembles drought stress with rolled leaves, discolored leaves, dry leaves, or streaked and spindly leaves. According to the Plant Biotechnical Journal, a publication talked about phosphites and referred to it in this way. Phosphites are a phytotoxic compound that causes growth inhibition at high dosages. A high dosage in this scenario is a half pound of potassium per thousand square feet. Applications at 2% use dilution can also cause phytotoxic symptoms. So this would also correlate to people who make low volume applications should be especially careful. Or even if you're applying with a backpack at say one gallon per thousand square feet, Pay special attention to your percent use dilution. That way you're not exceeding 2% and thus contributing to phytotoxic symptoms that can occur through the use of phosphites. In this picture, we can see both TIF Grand and TIF 419 that have had an application of phosphite applied. We can see the TIF Grand is exhibiting phytotoxicity symptoms to a bit of a greater degree than the TIF 419 is. And ultimately what happens is we have such great uptake and probably a pretty high percent use dilution. And thus a sensitive turf type is exhibiting symptoms of phytotoxicity. This is a common occurrence that can occur if not careful when using this type of product. Here we're going to take a look at another study that was conducted on corn. In P deficient situations where you are deficient in phosphate, because the plant does not know that it's taking up phosphite instead of phosphate, it can oftentimes exaggerate the symptoms of phosphate deficiency within the plant. As we can see here, the corn that was treated with phosphite in a P deficient situation performed much worse than a non-treated control in the same P deficient situation. However, we can see that if it was treated with phosphate, the plant performed ex exceptionally well. This is something to keep in the in back of your mind that if you do not have adequate soil levels of phosphate available to the plant, usage of phosphites can contribute and even exaggerate P deficiency scenarios. According to another study, this one is Biostimulants in Horticulture. This is by Dr. Giuseppe Cola and Dr. Yusuf Raphael. Phosphite has not been proved to have a direct effect on plant nutrition and should not be considered a proper fertilizer. The data points to phosphites attempted to be used as a fertilizer do not align with data both published and empirically deduced. And I think this will take us to point number three, which kind of moves into why do we see phosphites called fertilizers? And well, really what that comes down to are labeling laws. In order to get an EPA registration and register a product as a pesticide, so remember all fungicides are considered pesticides and fall under the EPA, it has to undergo significant testing. And when I say significant testing, you can spend upwards of $58 million 
to achieve all the qualifications and testing necessary in order to submit your proposal for EPA registration for a fungicide product or a pesticide. This is not feasible for a product that only controls one or two diseases. It would be very difficult to have the upfront cost of a $58 million investment followed by the cost of manufacturing and production. So why label it as a fertilizer? And more importantly, how do you label it as a fertilizer? Well, it comes down to this. Eventually, through oxidation, typically not within the plant, but if a soil application was made, within the soil, bacteria and thyme will allow phosphites to oxidize into phosphates. Oftentimes on fertilizer labels, especially in the agricultural sector, you'll see actual recommendations that year number one, this product will not give you any return on investment. But year number two is where you'll start to see some increased yields. And the reason why is because you're relying on that year of oxidation and a year of microbial degradation in order to convert the phosphites into phosphates for it to function as a fertilizer. If that does not occur, these products do not function as fertilizers. However, to circumvent the $50 million cost for an EPA registration, it's much easier to label these products as a fertilizer with the understanding that they're going to be used primarily as a fungicide. So we've looked at published data that says specifically phosphites are not fertilizers. We've seen empirical data of attempting to use a phosphite as a fertilizer backfiring and causing phytotoxic effects. So what other purposes do phosphites serve? Well, one look into this is do phosphites serve as biostimulants? In the agricultural world, we have unpacked evidence of this with increased yields with foliar applications uh, in, again, going back to potatoes and celery and avocados and other fruits and vegetables. However, we have no data in the turf grass world to point towards phosphites acting as a biostimulant. In fact, we have an all over the map type of response that we end up getting from these types of products. Really what it comes down to, and at least what the science has only been able to catch up with so far, is that any of the increased performance characteristics that we're getting out of it is most likely due to the fungicidal activities and maybe some of the mild bacterial side activities that we're getting from the actual phosphites. Not from a fertilizer component, nor from a direct biostimulant component, but maybe through a bit of a SAR listener component where we're kicking in some of the plant's natural defenses and then again also suppression of disease in some bacteria. Research is still ongoing in the turf grass world related to what other types of secondary effects are we getting out of phosphites. There's an upcoming, it's not yet published, study by Dr. Dempsey in the Journal of Plant Nutrition that takes a look specifically at phosphites on cool season grasses. And I'll read from the abstract here. Though phosphites in pea-sufficient root zones increase biomass in shoots, crowns, and roots, it also reduced root-to-shoot ratios. In pea-deficient root zones, phosphites reduced the growth of leaves, crowns, roots, and exaggerated pea-deficiency symptoms. So much like we kind of unpacked with corn, we're also seeing the same thing applied to cool-season grasses. Phosphites work well in one specific capacity, but if we do not have an underlying foundation in place, a good agronomic standpoint to stand on, then oftentimes phosphites can cause more problems and they're actually creating solutions for us. I also unpacked another study that pointed to phosphite have a potential to control microdochium patch. And in this study, what they actually showed was that Potassium phosphite applications alone did offer some level of control of microdochium patch. However, it was nowhere near statistically significant as applications of a proteome. However, combinations of potassium phosphite with a proteome perform better than potassium phosphite alone or a proteome alone. That is against a control of NP and K. So there is some promise when used as part of a fungicide management program of getting some additional benefit out of your fungicides when combined with a potassium phosphite. 
Now, what about the various phosphite formulations? We see them in many different shapes, sizes, and flavors. We'll see in 0026. And really what this means is that we have a greater concentration of phosphorus acid. Typically, we're going to see a pH somewhere around a 6.5. We'll see in 0031. And typically, that means we just have a greater concentration of potassium hydroxide in it. And that's going to have a pH of somewhere around 8. We're going to see formulations that look like a 430 We'll see uh, uh, formulations that look like a 6016, a 0030, a 02826. What we have to understand is that the P numbers in these phosphorus acid phosphite products are non-relevant because they are not supplying phosphorus to us. They're only supplying the phosphite ion. And even though there's these minor tweaks and formulation changes and one looking like this or the other, Really what it comes down to is what kind of secondary effects are you looking to get out of your product? And then also from the manufacturing standpoint, what does shelf stability look like? How does it play with other ingredients you may be adding to it? Or are you including an additional biostimulant into the package altogether? And that's why it's manipulating your analysis like that. Truth be known, the data all shows that they perform just about all the same. Uh, and really what it comes down to is do you need something that's going to function as a tank compatibility agent? How quickly are you going to be able to go through the product? And, and ultimately, what is the cost? So I think the final question that needs to be addressed is do I need to apply phosphites? Should I apply phosphites? And I think it comes down to a couple of different factors to take into consideration. Number one, are you growing a turf type that is susceptible to pythium? If you are, then yes, perhaps you should consider applying phosphites. However, before you apply phosphites, the next question you have to ask is, do you have sufficient phosphorus in your root zone available for the plant? If that is a no, you should get that corrected before you undergo applications of phosphites. If you have a turf type that is not susceptible to uh, pythium or you're not facing pythium pressure, should you apply phosphites? Probably not, unless you're going after the snow mold, which I've only found one study on. It may be out there. There may be a product specifically labeled for it that I'm just not privy to, but I've never really treated for pink snow mold anyway because I live in the South. So I hope you've taken away a lot from this video. Please show some support if you can. Uh, hit the like button and then tune into our stream on Thursdays. And we're going to try and stream more on Mondays as well. On Thursdays, we have the Thirsty Thursday with my friends, Ryan DeMay, a professional turfgrass manager, and my friend, Ray Ito, who's also a professional turfgrass manager. We like to uncover the science and get real nitty gritty with individual people and talk about whatever they may be facing on their property, while, of course, just having a cool drink in our hand. Thank you for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next one. Take it easy. Take it easy.